بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وآله وصحبه ومن وله. Uh, when my brother Ali asked me, uh, Sheikh Ali asked me uh, to participate, of course I said yes. And he asked me what I would like to talk about. And I chose this topic, how to find or how to choose a Sheikh. And this is a topic, to be honest, I've, I've been a little obsessed with actually for the last several years. And maybe before I end my talk, I can tell you why I think this topic is so important. But let me just jump right in. Uh, to address the topic and the question. And as a matter of fact, this is a question that I get a lot. People ask me, you know, who do I turn to for advice? Uh, who do I turn to for inspiration? Who should I listen to? Who should I follow? Etc. So that's sort of, all of those micro questions can be summed up in this one macro question, how to find a sheikh. Now, to answer this question thoroughly, please permit me to respond by, by asking other questions that I think need to be asked and, and we'll try to answer some of them. Some of them we'll just mention and we'll park to the side and maybe in a future gathering we can come back to them. When somebody says, how do I find a sheikh? It assumes in that question that finding a sheikh in and of itself is something that is good. In other words, there's an assumption that you need a sheikh, that you need somebody that is more learned, somebody that is more, uh, has more experience <clears throat> in this subject matter, specifically being Islam and Islamic studies. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of remembrance, ask the people of knowledge, if you do not know. In other words, by asking this question, you are not taking another path, which is, I don't need a sheikh, I can just do it myself, religion is private, I can just open the Qur'an and benefit uh, and understand on my own. In, in the study of Christianity, we, when we come to talk about sects and uh, the Protestant movement, we talk about the priestlyhood of all believers, that any Christian can uh, obtain the Bible, open the Bible, read the Bible, and interpret the Bible. So there is that strand unfortunately, which I of course do not agree with, because religion, specifically Islam, is not just something that is personal, it is also something that is a science to be studied, and science is plural, to study. So the first thing to acknowledge, that is if you're asking this question, or if, you're, or if you acknowledge the importance of this question, you are also assuming that it is important to have somebody that is learned, to have a sheikh, to have somebody that can guide you, can answer questions that you do not have. So that's, I think, important to state at the outset. Now, as far as the, as I said, the priestlyhood of all, all believers, maybe we can call it the, the sheikhhood of all believers. I mean, not to extrapolate too much. Maybe we can talk about that another time. And that's very important. It's a topic that I talk about uh, when I come to describe the difference between deen and tadayun. Deen being the study of religion and tadayun being one's personal piety. So I just, I just mention it, we park it to the side, and we'll keep going. Inshallah, we'll have an opportunity to talk about it again. So we've established that the question has merit, the question is important. Now the challenge is really, how do you differentiate between all of the people that are out there? How do you differentiate between all of the voices that exist? How do you filter the information that you're getting in the name of Islam? That's really one of the main challenges. So before we get to that type of criteria, let me say this. When we talk about finding a sheikh, there are two types of mashaykh that we are talking about. One is the more mainstream, I need a teacher. For example, I need a teacher to teach me tajweed. I need a sheikh to teach me grammar. I need a sheikh uh, because I have a fiqh question. Uh, I'm about to get married and I want to talk to somebody about what my obligations are and my rights and how does the nikah go, what's a walima, all of that. So I have you know, questions related to fiqh. Let's say it's like an academic question. That's one sheikh. There's another type of sheikh, which is I need a mentor. I need somebody that I can receive and, and get spiritual guidance from. 
I need somebody that can help me with my life problem. I, I have some personal issues. I might be anxious. I might be nervous. I might have challenges at home. I might have challenges at work. I might have difficulties in my marriage with my children. I need a sheikh that I can go to to, uh, to seek this kind of advice. Now already we are starting to make some differentiations. And part of this conversation is that we want to be able to discern things. One of the things that we learned at Al-Azhar is that one of the most important things of a student of knowledge and a scholar of knowledge is to be able to discern. We call it Al-Aql al The intellect that can discern and can differentiate between different things. So now we are starting to differentiate. First we differentiated, should we even get a shaykh or not? Now we are talking about there are two broad kinds. There are information that I need, I need a shaykh for that. And then there is more advice, mentorship, spiritual issues, I have a shaykh for that. Now before we get further and we talk about well, what sort of criteria are we looking at, it's important that we ask and answer another question, which is, are all of the mashayikh that we will come to identify, are they all the same or are they different? In other words, if we're in a room and it was a, a conference, for exam, example, of scholars, uh, and there was some conference you know, title and, and topic that we were discussing, and we, we flew in all of these ulama from different places, now would we stand back and look at that and, and would, can we say that they're all the same or are they different? So to help us answer that question, I have you know, three broad categories that I usually like to talk about just to make things a little bit more simple and, and straightforward. I call these the three Muslim personalities. There is the scholar, al-alim. There is the preacher, al-da'i. And there is the worshiper, al-abid. All three of them and these are just archetypes, by the way. You might find these three expressions in one person. For example, if you looked at somebody in the past, like Imam al-Ghazali. You know, Imam al-Ghazali was definitely a spiritual person. He was definitely an alim. He was definitely a preacher. You know, it was all wrapped up in one person. But usually that's not the case. Usually, you know, we have one forte. Usually we have one thing that we're really good at. And that's sort of the predominant characteristic that makes up our, our work. So if we think of these again as archetypes, there's the scholar, the preacher, the worshiper. It's important that we understand the differences between the three of those before we then return to our original question to understand what are the criteria for finding a sheikh. The scholar is somebody who spends 80-90% of their time in the books. They are experts in one, two, maybe three topics or subtopics. And they are more far removed from the comings and goings of people from day-to-day -day life. They're not so much in the know with social trends, but they are what we would call an ivory tower scholar. I don't say that to be negative or, or to be pejorative. Rather, we need the scholars. We need people who, who focus on that. Right now, as, as the world is scrambling to find a vaccine for uh, the COVID-19, I hope and I pray that there are these ivory tower scholars locked up in their labs, spending all of their time trying to find a vaccine. So that's a good example. You need that somebody to do that to advance that body of knowledge. You need to have somebody who's an expert on inheritance law. You need somebody who is an expert on Hanafi fiqh. You need somebody who is an expert on theological matters, so on and so forth for all of the Islamic sciences. Now, the, the, the da'i, the, the, the one who is the preacher, is almost the exact opposite of the scholar. If the scholar spends 80-90% of their time in the books, writing articles, reading, reviewing, coming out with critical editions of ancient books, attending conferences, advancing that science, that discipline, a couple of inches every few years, the da'i is the opposite. They spend 80-90% of their time with people. They have a firm knowledge of Islam. In other words, they could answer basic questions. They received the proper training. But most of their time is spent with people. So, so as well as the scholar knows their discipline, the, worship, the, the preacher rather 
knows how people are living their lives, know what's on people's minds, know what the social issues are. They interact with people at the mosque. Uh, they go to you know these social gatherings. They talk to people. They know who's going to college and who's getting married and who's having trouble in this and who's having trouble in that. They're, they have their finger on the pulse, as we say in English. So they're sort of the opposite. Now, the preacher's role is to motivate people, is to connect with people, is to help people connect with their faith. And that's why when you go to Jummah prayer, uh, and hopefully all of you are blessed uh, to uh, attend um, a Jummah that is inspiring, hopefully you get inspired from that Jummah. You don't want the khatib to stand there on Friday and start rattling you know, all of the different inheritance portions that are in Islamic law. I mean, everyone would fall asleep within, within two minutes. Even if you study that stuff, you'd fall asleep. It's, sometimes it can be so boring, even though it's important. But the preacher, think of the preacher like a coach, there to motivate you, to excite you, to exercise you, to make you sort of wake up and, yeah, you know, let's do something positive after Juma. You know, I was in a slump. I want to get back to my prayers on time. I want to pray Fajr on time. I want to make up my fasting days, etc., etc., etc. So they motivate you. Rather than pushing a discipline of knowledge forward, they are pushing you forward. And then there is the worshiper, the abid. These are the people that we consider the saints amongst us. These are the people that are always reading the Qur'an, are always praying, are always fasting. They, are, they have a saintly demeanor. We usually, we, we go to them when, uh, when we need dua. You say, you know, Sidi, can you please make dua for me? I'm not feeling well. Or, you know, Mawlana, can you make dua that I pass my exams? Just like we go to our parents and say, Mom, Dad, can you make dua for me? I have a job interview tomorrow. So the worshiper's job is to serve as an example of how Islam can inspire a person and elevate a person. Now, if you not to belabor this, but if you look at the three categories, the, 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 the scholar, the preacher, and the worshiper, you will see that each one has a different function, has a different role. And it's very important to identify, when we go back to our original question of how do you find a sheikh, it's very important that we identify who is this person that we are going to. So we don't go to the wrong person and ask the wrong piece of information. I'm not going to go to the saintly person and ask them the fiqh question. I'm not going to go to the scholar and ask them you know, about troubles I might be having at work. I'm not going to go to the da'i and ask them a difficult question that is you know, with the, the minutia of knowledge. Now, if you reflect on what I said and what I'm saying, just for a moment you will see that unfortunately for us as English-speaking Muslims, we have made a mess of all of these three categories. And again, these are not silos. And, and again, hopefully there are aspects of each of these in one person. I don't deny that. Just for the sake of articulating this issue, I'm just using this as an example. Unfortunately, we've confused all of this. We refer to preachers as ulama. For example, not to belittle what the preachers do, but the preacher is not an alim. And not only have we as the public consumed it, but unfortunately Muslim personalities, quote-unquote, people that have a following or people that uh, put out content all the time, they themselves have also, unfortunately, many times become confused about these different categories. In other words, they have not identified what their role is well enough, they have not articulated their role to themselves. And therefore, they have appropriated for themselves certain things that they are not qualified to do. It takes a large person to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this question. You need to ask somebody else. You know, we were always reminded of the famous story of Imam Malik, radiallahu anhu, uh, in which you know, somebody came with uh, you know, dozens and dozens of questions, and most of them he responded to, I don't know. And the famous statement that saying, I don't know, is half of knowledge because وَفَوْقَ قُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Allah Ta'ala says in the Qur'an above everyone who knows there is one who knows even more so knowledge is never ending and it takes a lot of humility for one to acknowledge you know I just don't know so one of the, the pro, there, so there are two problems here one is us as a community giving different personalities titles that are not deserving to them and two, people that are now in the public sphere 
not realizing that I have a lane. You know, in English we say, can you stay in your lane? Hopefully in South Africa, everyone's staying in their lane, driving, right? We want to stay in our lane. Well, you have to stay in your lane also and work. You know, I have a certain skill set. I have a certain function. I have to remind myself of what that function and that skill set is. And if you don't, then you're all over the place. You're swerving in and out of lanes and, and you know, you'll go over to this lane and you'll say something and it won't be true. It'll turn out to be wrong. You'll go to that lane and you'll say something that won't be true and, it'll be, and it will misguide people. And then you will live, unfortunately, to regret those statements. Okay, so now we've articulated a little bit that we have these three uh, uh, personalities. So we go back, how do you find a sheikh? We said, well, there are really two kinds. One is an academic information-based sheikh, and the other is sort of more of a spiritual sheikh. So right there, it's important for you to understand who you are going to for what. You don't, you're not necessarily going to ask for life advice from your tajweed teacher. I, I mean, maybe, maybe you can. Maybe if they're a, um, a saintly person and you know, they, they seem to have their act together, uh, you can ask them. But that's traditionally not their role. Their role is to teach you tajweed. As a matter of fact, you wouldn't even ask your tajweed teacher about tafsir. Because a good tajweed teacher is somebody who knows all of the qira'at and all of the tajweed rules and, you know, is reading the jazariya and, you know, can, can talk to you about how the Qur'an is written and the script of the Qur'an, everything with the recitation and the preservation of the script of the Qur'an. But that's very different than tafsir. Tafsir is a whole other ballgame because you need all these other auxiliary disciplines for you to be able to make sense of the verses. You know, is this a general statement or a particular statement? Is it a general statement, but it is intended to be a particular statement? All of the things that we learn about in usul al-fiqh, these are the type of things that you would need if you were going to make tafsir. So again, who am I going to and for what? So... Other than those two broad categories, let me now give you what I think are four very simple, easy to remember rules for how you can find a sheikh, something to keep in mind, uh, a tool that you all of you can use to help filter the information that you're getting. Because my, my big uh, hope from you listening to this is that you recognize the importance of having a filter and not just you know submitting to whoever is around you. Okay, the first criteria is that every teacher of any discipline in the name of Islam has to have a chain of transmission back to the Prophet ﷺ and permission to teach that which they are teaching. That's the first criteria. In other words, the person has to have a certificate. You know when you go to a doctor's office and in in the wall behind them are all these certificates? You know, there's a reason why they do that. It's to show you that I graduated from this school, I did this specialty, I'm certified by this medical association, therefore you can trust, you know, at least you can trust me that I have a baseline knowledge. The ijaza, the sanad in Islam is that baseline knowledge. Now that can be achieved by studying one-on-one with somebody or it can also be achieved by studying at a seminary or an Islamic university. I mean, there are many ways to do it. I'm not saying that it has to look like one model. But let me tell you, you have to have that permission. You know, ijaza, it's, it's, it means a license, a permission to do this or to do that. You are, you are free to, to begin the journey to teach that discipline. I remember when I was a graduate student and I was working on my thesis at Princeton, uh, I, I was interested in a, in a certain topic and I w- my, my approach was I want to analyze the ulama's view of this topic. You know, in my mind, that was very simple. But then when I started you know, negotiating my topic with my advisors, I realized that, that just defining what it means to be an alim is a whole can of worms. Because everyone means something. So I remember I, I had to spend you know, a, a huge amount of time, about six, seven months, really finding the right way to articulate what is the baseline for what constitutes a scholar, for what constitutes a sheikh. The first one is that they have to be licensed to do that. You could lock yourself up in a library for decades. That doesn't make you a scholar. You can read and read and read and read and read, it also doesn't make you a scholar. 
but you have to go through the process of studying with somebody who is licensed that discipline to teach you how to read, how to study, to teach you the professional association standards of that discipline. And that's the stuff that's not necessarily codified in books, but it comes through that process itself. So whether it's tajweed, whether it's grammar, uh, or the Arabic or language sciences, or tafsir, or mantiq, or kalam, you know, aqidah, fiqh, usul, whatever, that's, whatever the case may be, that person needs to be licensed to do that. Now, if the person is not licensed, they are not going to fit into the framework that we have been painting. They are not somebody that you are going to be able to benefit from completely. Now, they might have some khair, they might, have, you know, they might be a good person, good brother, good sister, they might be well-intentioned, they might say something right, but they equally might say something wrong. So you have a risk there. Number two is the importance of finding somebody whose conduct is as close to the sunnah as possible or at least strives to have their conduct as close to the sunnah as possible. Now this is something a little bit different than we would, you know, in like our secular world. You know, you're not looking for a physician who's necessarily practicing the sunnah, or a lawyer or an accountant who's practicing the sunnah. But when it comes to the deen and the, the sciences of the deen, it's a little bit different. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us that the prophets do not have any wealth that they pass on. There's no inheritance to the prophet or the prophets, plural. But this religion and the science and the study of this religion is the inheritance of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, that the ulama, they are the ones who have inherited from the Prophet ﷺ. So every aspect of this deen that you take from somebody, you are taking from the Prophet ﷺ. That's an aspect of his personality. That's an aspect of his teaching. That's an aspect of the revelation that he was blessed with and that he passed on to his companions and that they passed on to us anhum. So therefore, because I am taking something which is part and part intrinsically linked with the person of the Prophet ﷺ, the person that's giving me that has to be an exemplary of that to the best of their ability. I mean, we're not perfect. You know, we're never going to be like the Sahaba, of course. But we have to at least recognize that that's a standard. You know, that's an important thing. That, that decorum, that, those ethics, that style, that demeanor, that kindness, that rahmah, that has to be part of it. Because if you take religion from somebody who doesn't acknowledge that, and if you take religion from somebody who has a dry, uh, difficult personality, this is the type of religion that ends up becoming extreme. Because the religion that we were taught by the Mashaykh and the religion that goes all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ is nothing other than an unfolding and manifestation through time of mercy. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except as a mercy to mankind. The Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, I am a merciful gift. I was only sent to refine human character. So any religion that you take, even if it's like grammar or uh, syntax, sarf, or like logic, you know, the dry stuff, even that stuff has to have an impact in improving your behavior and your conduct. But if you like learn nahu, and then you go around showing off that you know Nahu and no one knows Nahu and stuff like that, you've missed the whole point. Because that's not the point of learning Nahu. The, the point of learning Nahu is that you can read the Qur'an correctly and understand the language of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, so the closeness of the Sunnah, I mean that in and of itself we can just talk on endlessly, but that's an essential part of the criteria. So that's number two. Number three is that there has to be the teacher, the shaykh that you go, that you go to, has to make the process of approaching them and the process of studying easy. Because the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is ease, not hardship. The Prophet ﷺ was never given a, 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 an option, except that he chose the easier of the options as long as there was no sin involved. It's narrated by Abu Dawood. So therefore, the way of ease is also part of the sunnah. 
of the Prophet ﷺ, but there's also a, a strategic element to it, which is if you go to a sheikh who makes everything difficult, chances are, one, you're not going to understand, or two, you're not going to go back to that person for advice. The Prophet ﷺ, يَسِرُوا وَلَا تُعَسِرُوا Make things easy, don't make things difficult. The best type of religion is, a, a, is the pure Hanafi way, the Prophet ﷺ said. That's the best type of religion. Ease, simple, easy going, not lazy, you know, but sort of kicked back and relaxed and alhamdulillah and Allah loves you and it's and you that's that's religion, right? That's that's what the Prophet ﷺ came uh, to give us. You know, very rarely should the teacher become upset or enraged or you know or something like that. And you want the path, you know, your path to be facilitated. So I have a question, like one of the examples I gave, you know, before is uh, about marriage. You know, a lot of people come to me, oh, I'm trying to get married or I am getting married. You know, can you give me some advice? You, you, you want to give them like easy, simple advice that they can take and really live with it. Not, you know, like, a, well, let me tell you, there are a hundred points of uh, advice for the man and his obligations in the marriage. You know, you might turn people off that way. So you need somebody who makes the religion easy. You need somebody who themselves uh, is easy. Uh, and because you who are listening to me now are predominantly in South Africa, you, 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 are, you are a beautiful people. You understand this uh, more than most people, is that your culture is a culture, you're always smiling and you're always happy. You know, unfortunately, there are other Muslim cultures that are not like that. So ease is very important. And then number four is there needs to be a level of compatibility between you and that sheikh. You know, whether you're studying uh, the outward sciences or whether you're going to somebody for like as a mentor or as a spiritual guide, there has to be a level of rapport and compatibility. If that doesn't happen, then it's going to be very difficult for you to benefit. Again, because what you are taking from that sheikh is not just information or advice, it is a part of the Prophet ﷺ. And you must be ready to receive that. And part of that bridge of that information or that advice coming from them and then transferring it to you requires that kind of compatibility. Just like when people get married, it requires that there's a level of compatibility. Or why are some people friends with each other but they're not friends with other people? Maybe they're not enemies but they're just, I don't get along with so-and-so. There's no compatibility. The chances of me benefiting from the person who I really can't stand or I really can't get along with or I can't stand the way that they talk or I can't stand the sound of their voice, some people are like that, you're not going to benefit from that person. It doesn't mean that the sheikh is wrong or false. It doesn't mean that you are wrong or false. It just means that there is no uh, compatibility in that regard. So it's also important that you find somebody that you feel comfortable with, so, given all of the other criteria uh, that we have given. So as I sort of come now to, to round out the, this conversation, I want to go back to uh, maybe the beginning. As I said in the beginning, at the end, inshallah, I'll mention why I'm obsessed with this. Uh, there are really two things for me that, that, that stick out. Number one is I really, really, truly lament the uh, plethora of voices that we have in the English-speaking world in the name of Islam that clearly do not follow any of these criteria or are lacking on many of these criteria. I lament how they have created more harm than good over time. Maybe in the moment they created some good, but when you ride that out over a couple of years and maybe even a decade or more, unfortunately they have created problems. And, and that's something that makes me upset. Uh, somebody who has spent uh, now, mashallah, I mean pushing on 25 years now that I've been, you know, studying Islam in, you know, different places in different ways. But when you spend so much time looking at something, you kind of, it's like your baby, you know, you feel like, and, and when you see somebody abusing that which you hold so precious and so dear, uh, it, it upsets you. The other thing is, as somebody who has some business experience, I, I recognize that in the business world, if you're starting a business and you need advice, you know, you're not going to go to somebody who, who started a business and failed. 
you're going to go to somebody who's doing something similar to you or attempted something similar and had some kind of success and you ask them for advice. In other words, the, it, it's in other aspects of our life, it's recognized who we go to for what pieces of information. But yet when it comes to religion, it's like a free for all. We never even stop to think, or maybe we have stopped stopping to ask ourselves these type of questions. And the way we sort of automatically get it, you know, would you ask somebody, if, if, if you wanted to ask somebody's advice on finances, most likely you would ask somebody who is financially successful. You're not gonna ask a poor person their advice on finances. But when it comes to religion, that's exactly what we're doing by not following these criteria. We're, that's, we're doing the exact same thing. We're asking the wrong person, the wrong question, getting the wrong piece of information, taking that, saying it's Islam, and then wondering why we're not spiritually uplifted, wondering why people have stopped you know, practicing Islam, so on and, and so forth. So. These, this, for this reason, this is a central issue for me. And this is something that I, I, I've kind of instilled in my platform, Making Sense of Islam. I've written about it, I talk about it, and that's why I wanted to share that with you. Uh, hopefully you find this useful, I really hope you do. Uh, again, I wanna thank uh, my brother and my colleague, uh, Ali Khalfi, Sheikh Ali Khalfi, for uh, extending me this invitation uh, and giving me this opportunity. والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم